All right, here we go. Last unit for this class. Unit six. We've been talking about the different constructs that we can use to create the logic for programming. This is the third and final one. Using these three uh, constructs that we've been talking about, you'll be able to determine the logic for any program, for any method. Sequential processing, decision processing, and now looping. Using those three pieces, and that's all there is, you can define the logic for any program. Now, there's still a whole lot more to programming, otherwise I'd give you a degree tomorrow or next week and <clears throat> ship you out skyward and say, here they are, they're ready to go. There's a lot more to it. There's memory management, there's data structures, there's classes, and there's lots and lots more programming techniques to learn. Plus, there's other languages, there's other environments, including mobile and web, database connectivity, etc. There's a lot of stuff to learn yet, but when it comes to the logic and processing those things, the only thing you'll use is sequential processing, decision processing, and looping. So this is that third construct. When we talked about decision concepts, we thought we saw that there were two tools that we could use, if statements and its their various forms, and switch statements. When it comes to looping, there are three tools. Jane, would you close that door for me? The first is a counter control loop. And we'll talk about each one of these in great detail. This is just kind of the overview. A counter control loop. There's also a pretest loop, often called a while loop. And there's a post test loop, often called a do while loop. Whenever you want your program to do something again, do it over and over and over again, you use one of these three kinds of loops. But how do you know which one? Well, actually, I created a flowchart to help you decide. I remember when we were doing decisions, if there was one question with three or more answers, you used a switch statement, otherwise you had to use an if statement. For looping, we first need to know, you need, first need to ask yourself, do you know the exact number of times that you're going to loop? In programming terms, that's an iteration, one cycle through the loop. If you, the programmer, know, or your program itself can figure it out exactly how many times you're going to loop, then you use that counter control loop. And that's the one that happens most often. We're going to start with that one today. We're going to do some examples. It's the kind of loop that's most often used. If you don't know how many times you're going to loop, for instance, the user screws up, so we yell at them. How many times are they going to screw up? We don't know. If it's my granddaughter, she screws up on purpose just to make the sound come on that yells at her for doing things wrong. We don't know how many times it's going to screw up. And so that's an example, one example, of where we don't know the number of iterations. Maybe we're reading from a file. This is next semester, and we want to read one line out of the file. How many lines are in the file? We don't know ahead of time. We could go all the way through the file and count them, but by the time we're done counting them, we could have processed them. So we don't know how many, file, how many lines are in the file. We don't know how, how many iterations. If there's at least one, at least one iteration, then you use a post-test loop. If you might have zero, how many times is the user going to screw up? Might be zero. If there could be zero iterations, then you use a pretest loop. And again, we'll learn the difference between these, but by the time you're done with this chapter, you'll have seen and had a chance to play with all three kinds of loops. In the real world, real world you got to figure out which one to use. These counter control loops, also known as for loops, are used so often that some programmers are actually starting to manipulate them, morph them, to turn them into what would normally be a do while or a pretest loop. Not a big fan of that. In order to make that happen, you've got to have an exit in the middle of the loop, which isn't normal. Remember, structured programming theory says there should be one entry and one exit. For loops, that entry and exit, there's only one for each. And if you use those other hybrid techniques of mixing these up, you've got to have a, a jump out of the middle of the loop. And that's, I don't think, real good programming practice, unless it's a very small loop. So again, one iteration is one cycle through the loop. If you know how many times, like display the populations of all the states. 
And by the way, if you're trying to follow along in the notes pretty soon here, it's going to turn inside out. So I decided that since for loops are so often used, I'm going to focus on them at the beginning and leave the other ones toward the end. So once again, all the notes are out of date. All the pages are there. They're just in a different order now. Display the population of all the states. There's 50, so I know exactly how many times I'm going to loop. Display all the even numbers from 0 to 100. There's 50, so I know how many times I'm going to loop. If I know exactly how many times, I use a for loop. If you don't know, then you use, but there's one, the loop has to process once. That's a post-test loop. Otherwise, it's a pre-test loop. Now, I'm going to quickly jump down here to the end, just kind of watch the screen. Here's a pre-test loop. Notice there's a condition at the top of the loop, pre. Before processing the loop, we ask a question, and it's possible to skip the loop altogether. It's a pretest loop. Then there's a post-test loop where the decision is at the bottom. I have to go through the process once. If the condition is true, I come back up and do it again. So that's the basic picture of those other two. Now back to the top. Here's what a counter control loop looks like. And this one is a different beast. And this is why we're going into Visio today. Because there's a new symbol in there. And that is a Volker created symbol. You'll never see it anywhere. I've never, I've never seen it anywhere else. Nobody yet stolen it from me. Okay. This is how I flowchart my counter control loops. A counter control loop, and I'm going to start calling them a for loop because just about every language in the world uses for as the keyword to implement this. There are exceptions, but not many. I'm going to call it a for loop. The for loop uses a counter to count because we know how many times we're going through the loop, so the for loop does the counting for us. It's part of the loop structure. It's part of the loop control. And so when we hit the top of the loop, notice there's one entry, and we loop, and there's one exit. Very similar to a pretest loop. This actually is a pretest loop different form of one. It is possible to come in here and immediately exit. But this loop includes a counter. When we come in, the first thing you and I as programmers have to define is where do we want to start counting? Where do we usually start? At the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. What's usually the beginning? One or zero. <clears throat> But there's no rule that says we have to start at 1 or 0. Computers, by the way, like to start counting at 0. So if we have a whole list of items, students, Alan would be student number 0 and Matt would be student number 1. When computers count, that's the way they count. Okay, so it is very common to start counting at 0, also at 1. But we don't have to with a counter control loop. We can start at 100 and work our way down. We can start at 100 and work our way up by fives. Counter control loops in their classic form are very, very flexible. Typically, however, we start at 1. We go up or 0. We go up by 1. We count 1 every time we finish the loop. We count 1. And then the other thing that you and I have to define is when do we end? At what condition do we jump out of the loop? So this loop automatically starts the counter. Let's pretend it's one. Comes down here, said, am I done yet? No. Then process, process, process. Come back up. Increment the counter. That all happens automatically. The counter's now two. Are we done yet? No. Do it again. Increment the counter. Are we done yet? No. Increment the counter. Are we done yet? Yes. And then we finally get out. So inside here is all the stuff that we need to control our loop. In pseudocode, it looks like this. Keyword for. Then some variable. You get to pick it. It doesn't have to be count. I usually pick either. Sometimes, often, I will pick a single letter that represents what I'm counting. If I'm counting students, I might use S. If I'm counting cars, I might use C. But it's just a variable name. You can call it whatever you want, including student and car. Whatever you want to call it. It's a variable. Then whatever value we start counting at. Maybe one, maybe a hundred. The keyword two, and this is pseudocode. 
And then where do we stop? If you're not counting by ones, then you say by tens, by minus one, by twos, by whatever you want to count. If you're counting by ones, and you usually are, you can leave that out. So square brackets mean it's optional. Inside here, we got a bunch of statements. At the bottom is an end for, and what you, the programmer, know is when we hit the end for, we automatically go back up and see if we've made it to the last value yet. Actually, the first thing we do is bump the counter up. Have we reached the last value yet? If not, then keep processing. Bump it up again. If we hit the end, actually, have we gone past the end? If this says from 1 to 10, this will process 10 times. When the counter hits 11, then it automatically jumps out. You can kind of see, it's easier to see in the flowchart. When we hit 10, this might say 10 or 11, greater than 10 is what that would usually say. We hit greater than 10, we get out. Very easy to see here. You, the programmer, when you look at pseudocode, have to know you're going to go from 1 to 10 by 1. And when you hit 11, this loop is going to end. Every time you hit the bottom, it automatically comes back up again. Actually, I think C-sharp makes it a little clearer. In C-sharp, use the keyword for all lowercase. A very common technique is to declare your, very, your loop counter right inside the loop. This variable now has loop scope, context scope. I defined it in the loop. It's only available to the loop. As soon as the loop is done, that variable is gone. It doesn't even make it to the end of the method. End of the loop, that variable's gone. So I declare it. Most of the time, the counter is an integer. doesn't have to be. We can count by doubles and decimals. So we can go up by a half, down by a half, up by a quarter, up by a tenth. We can do any of those. But if you do that, then obviously you need to have a counter that's a double. Typically, it's an integer. This says my counter starts off at 1. And then the next thing we check immediately is, is my counter still less than or equal to last? This is equal to the loop condition. Under what conditions do I continue to loop? Under what condition do I continue? So this says as long as the counter is less than or equal to the last value, whatever that happens to be. If we're still less than or equal to the last, then we process these statements. By the way, what kind of statements can those be? What do you think? If statements. Pardon me? If statements. If statements. Sequential processing. Anything. We can put a switch statement inside a loop. We can put an if statement inside a loop. We can put if statements with switch statements that have loops inside them with if statements inside them inside of this loop. Whatever your logic requires, you can put in there. So they're not just single, almost looks like sequential processing statements here. That's any kind of C-sharp statement. So what happens here, the way I usually draw this, and I could put it on the board, but it won't work very well, is when we hit the top of the loop, we initialize the counter. This happens first. And then we immediately check to see if we should continue. So this happens next. If count is less than last, then we process. And when we hit the end curly bracket, curly brackets here are required, as long as there's more than one statement inside the loop. I almost always put them in. When we hit the bottom, we automatically come back up, but we come back up here. And this says, count plus plus. Bump the counter up by one. And then we check the condition again. Just like in this diagram shows, we come up here, we bump up the counter, and then we check the condition. Do we go this way or do we go that way? So we bump up the counter. Is its count still less than last? Yes. Process. We hit the bottom, come back up, bump up the counter do the condition. This all happens automatically. I'm just describing to you what happens, but it all happens automatically. You define where we start, you define when we continue, you define what we do to the counter every time through the loop, and C-sharp takes over from there. It counts, it automatically stops when it's time. It's very simple to define loop and very, very efficient. One last thing that'll answer your question. There are three parts to this. All three parts are typically required. There are ways to skip it, but let's not go there. 
each of the three parts, the initialization, the condition to continue, and the increment are separated with semicolons. There's no semicolon there. There is a, this is a required semicolon, that's a required semicolon, and there's no semicolon there. Parentheses around the loop condition, curly brackets around the body of the loop. Matt? Um, in this example here, is last a variable that's declared outside of this? Correct. Okay. Somewhere up above here, magically last got its value. Maybe we read it. We're going to do some examples. Read it from a text box, calculated it, who knows? Somewhere last got defined, and we're using it here. Count, however, CNT, is only available inside this loop. And then could you just have a, var or a value instead of a variable? Yes, you may put a number here. So if I, when we're going to do that, if I wanted to go to 100, I could put the number 100 in there. If I wanted to, this could be a variable. Maybe I ask the user, where do you want to start counting? And they go from there. Or maybe I generate a random number and I start counting at 12, and then generate another random number and go to 75. These, anywhere you see numbers, you could put in variables. <clears throat> anywhere you see variables, you could put in numbers except for count. Good questions. I think I discussed most of this, but let's make sure. Most commonly type of use, type of loop in object-oriented programming. Did I skip a paragraph or did I move that thing? When to, oh, there it is. When to use loops. I skipped that, so I went backwards. When to use loops. Whenever you want to do something over and over and over again, use a loop. In object-oriented programming programs like C, loops are used less than they used to be. The C-sharp developers discovered that we do this a lot. Why don't we write a statement that just does it? so that poor Robert doesn't have to write this over and over and over again. Like sorting an array used to be a loop. It's not anymore. It's just a command, take this array, sort it, done. Inside, behind the scenes, there's still a loop, but you and I don't have to write the loop. There'll be some other things when we start writing code for combo boxes and list boxes that I used to write loops for, that now there's a command one line that does it. A lot of my loop examples have gone away. Classic loop example, if you were a COBOL programmer, run the program. When you get to the bottom, ask the user, do you want to do this again? If the user says yes, you go back up. Post-test loop, right? Go through it once. At the bottom, ask them, do you want to do it again? If they say yes, go back up. When you hit the bottom, do you want to do it again? Yes, go back up. <laughs> when they say no, you drop out. We don't do that anymore, do we? In your math program, in your gas estimate program, how do you start over? Do you ask the user, do you want to do it again? <clears throat> no. You hit the clear button. And we start over. So that example, that was one of my favorite examples of loops. Trashed. Don't use it anymore. Another one is validation. Ask the user to enter a value. While it's bad, yell at them. Ask them to enter it again. How many times are they going to screw it up? We don't know. Pretest loop, ask him to enter it, then while it's bad, yell at him, enter it again, come back up. Is it still bad? Yell at him, enter it again. Is it still bad? Yell at him again. It's a loop. But we don't use that anymore. In object-oriented programming, when you leave the field, there's a validating event. And there's no loop. So another example that's trashed. We will be using for loops for all kinds of stuff, particularly with collections. In a combo box, there's a collection of text. In a list box, there's a collection of text, and we're going to process those using for loops. We're going to process the contents of a file. That is still a pretest loop, in programming logic intermediate. We're going to process database records. We'll go out to a database. How many student records are there? 150. Okay, <laughs> let's start. The nice thing about databases is they will tell you how many there are. And so you can use a for loop for that, where before that might have been a post-test loop. So whenever you want to do stuff over and over again, that's a loop. We haven't written any yet. We'll start. Now back to for loops. For loop includes the new hexagon symbol. <coughs> I'm going to show you how to create this in Visio. Easy answer is you copy mine and then change the text. We don't have to start at 1 or 0, but we usually do. 
Another example, maybe cancel checks in my database. Cancel checks don't start at 0 or 1. They usually start at 101 or something like that. We can use for loops for that. For loops can also count down, so we can start at 100, go down by fives, go down by one, go down by half, whatever we want to do. Usually the increment is plus one, but it could be anything, plus two, plus five, minus one, minus a half. And we've already talked about what does it look like in C sharp. Again, there's three required parts. Where do I start? Notice in this example, the counter is not initialized inside the loop. That's because there's not enough room here. That's all. Normally, I will initialize and declare the counter right inside the loop, so I put an int on that. But that's assuming that this counter is an integer. It must be probably because I'm going up by one. Plus plus means go up by one, right? This can also be plus equals 0.5 go up by half. It can be any calculation that you want it to be. Typically it's plus plus. So let's try this. First thing I'm going to do is pause the recording. All right, as an example, I have a friend who works in a convenience store and at the end of the night their cashiers have to count money. Right. And for some reason, this cashier, and this is a lame example, I apologize, but that's one of the problems with loops. Come in with the real examples that are fairly simple. They don't usually have much value. But this person doesn't really do well with nickels. So what we're going to do is provide a little app for this person where they count the number of nickels. They can count okay, but they can't seem to do the math. Okay, find out how much those nickels are worth. So we're just going to write a quick little app, and if you've got two nickels, it's 10 cents. If you've got 23 nickels, it's $1.15, and et cetera. Okay. Relatively little simple app, but we're going to make it look really professional. Please. Well, I'll tell you. Something's clogging my machine up. Now you don't need updates in the background? possible. All right, so here's my app. What I'm going to do, what we're going to do is they just say click show nickels and it's going to show a list. And then it's their job to scroll through the list and find the number of nickels that they have and find out how much they're worth. Okay. First off, a different technique. This is a text box. If you click on it, you'll see it's called text nickel values. Does the user going to be able to change that and type in there? No. It's a read-only text box. Notice the read-only property is set to true, mm. which means the user can only read what's inside this text box. Why am I using a text box? Because I don't know how many rows deep this nickels is going to go. It might The user might ask for 200 nickels, 500 nickels. I wouldn't be able to scroll through this list. A list box, or a label, excuse me, doesn't have a scroll bar. So if I put them into a label, and I could, I can't scroll. And so to allow me a little more flexibility, I've decided to use a text box so that I can scroll through the list if the list is long enough. So what we want to do is generate a list of nickels. So let's go into the show nickels routine. And let's collapse this big, huge, ugly comment. We'll make use of that in a little while. But for right now, let's get it out of the way so it doesn't bother you. And here's my event. So I'm going to give it a quick description because many of you are still forgetting this. I use, and you should also use, slash star technique, block comments for these. This method should be complete sentence. Shows the number of nickels and the corresponding value of each one. To start off with, I'd like to just generate a list of numbers of nickels from five, because we don't, this, even though this person needs a little help with their nickels, they can handle the zero. 
Okay, so we're not going to show them zero nickels, what that's worth. That part they've got figured out. So we're going to start counting at five and go to 250, but we're counting nickels, so I want to bump up by five. So this is just our first example of a for loop. So a for loop starts with the word, keyword for, and then in parentheses, the three conditions. Where do we want to start? First of all, what type of variable? I'm counting nickels, so I'm going to use an integer. And I'm going to call it just nickel equals 5. I'm going to start at 5. Semicolon. Then, under what conditions do I continue? As long as the nickel value is less than or equal to 250. It's just a number I've picked. We could make that a constant, right? Because I should be getting nervous now. 250, that could change. Could make it a constant. Later on, we'll make it an input. So the user provides us that information. But this is just an example of how for loops work, and they generally are a little easier to understand if we're using real numbers here to start with. Semicolon. And then what do I want to do to my nickel counter every time through the loop? In this example, I want to bump it up by 5. Again, that could be any equation that manipulates the nickel counter somehow. And press tab to jump over the parenthesis and then add a curly bracket. Press enter. And I'm going to label that curly bracket just like I've been doing all the others. So once I get piles of loops with switch statements and if statements inside them that have loops inside the false part, I can tell all the curly brackets part. Now what do I want to do every time through the loop? What I will often suggest to students is before you write the loop, write the contents. Make it work once. So let's take a little pause here. Let's take that loop out. I'm going to highlight it and just comment it out for a minute. And then in between here, in between here, I'm going to make it happen once. Right. I'm going to say I want to display these nickels in that text box. Text nickel values dot text. And every time I do this, I want to concatenate to the end of what's in the text box. So I'm going to say concatenate equals. Take whatever's in the text box. Add this to the end. Add what? Let's just use an example. 100. <coughs> Semicolon. Well, that's not real hard. No, not really. But this is what I want to do every time through the loop. Does it work when I do it once? This should just display the number 100 in my text box. It does. Okay, that wasn't terribly hard. But if you're having trouble trying to figure out what does my loop do, take the loop out and code one iteration of the loop. What do you want it to do once? And if you can get it to do that, then you do what I call wrap a loop around it. And now how many times is it going to do it? I don't know how many steps there are. How many iterations are there between 5 and 250? I don't know. But right now it's going to display the number 100 over and over and over again. Ew. Click it again. Looks like binary from way back. <laughs> yeah. War Games movie or whatever. Okay. That's kind of ugly looking. But it did display 100 over and over and over again. Right? But what it didn't do is list them vertically. So how do I get this to add a new line in the middle of my string? A couple of ways. Dot n slash root. Pretty good. All right. What Matt said is dot what? Was it dot? It's not n dot. We have to concatenate here. You're on the right track. Let me show you the hard way first, and then I'll show you the shortcut. Plus environment dot new line. <coughs> I hate that one. Not much typing because I typed env.n and I got it, but it still takes up awful lot of room on my line. And if I run it now, all the 100 should be stacked. There we go. 
And notice the scroll bar, and I can scroll through and see all of my 100s. So that's one way. Let me show you the shorter way. So I'm going to put a comment on that so it stays there so you can see it. You can also concatenate a backslash R backslash N. Well, that's kind of confusing looking, isn't it? That's a carriage return, which means go back to the beginning of the line. And it's a new line, which means it's moved out. If you do one or the other, you only get one or the other. It would move down right where it's at if you did an N, and it would move back without moving down if you just did the R. Swift just finally said, that's stupid. And in Swift, you do a backslash N, and you're done. But in C-sharp, we still have to do a backslash R, backslash N. What I've started doing is this. I'm going to create a constant. It's going to be a string, needs to be private. And I'm going to call it carriage return. If you want to, you can call it carriage return line feed, but I'm just going to go with carriage return, and that's equal to that. <laughs> carriage return. No, I don't want to create parms. Go away. Equals that backslash r backslash n. Then down here, all I have to say is CR. And I should get the same results. OK, so this says, take whatever's in the text box, add to it, leave what's in there, add to it a 100 and a carriage return over and over and over again. Well, why do I want to see 100 over and over? I don't. This is an example. What do I really want to see? the current value of nickel. Notice you can use the loop variable, and it's pretty common, use the loop variable inside the loop. Sometimes you use it for math. In this case, I'm displaying it. It's the counter. Now, let's analyze this one more time. Remember how for loops work. We come in here, nickel starts off at 5. Is 5 less than 250? Yes, it is. So we come down here, nickel has a value of 5. We display the number 5 and a carriage return. We hit the end of the loop. We come back up. We automatically process this. This happens automatically. It's how a for loop works. Nickel gets bumped up by 5. It's now 10. Is 10 less than 250? Yes, it is. So we display 10 and a carriage return. Hit the end of the loop, 15, 20, 25. We just keep going. Then we hit 250. Is 250 less than or equal to 250? Yes, equal to. We display the 250. Notice every time we go through this loop, nickel has a different value. And so it displays something different every time through the loop. Then we hit the bottom, bump it up, 255. Is that less than 250? No, the loop automatically ends. That's how for loops work. One, two, count the curly bracket. Three lines of code, and I generate a list that is this long. Steve. Well, you said something that confused me. If you're, if you're putting five into the variable nickel, mm -hmm. but you're adding five to it right away, shouldn't the first Well, well where am I adding five to it right away? Well, that, tell me. This last line does not execute first time through the loop, this last part. Okay. This part only executes when you come back up. The way I draw it on the board, if I had a whiteboard here, you can come back to class tomorrow and watch me draw it. But I, I draw the line from here, up, and into here. Right? So the way I draw the line, if you follow my mouse, it comes down to nickel. Then it does the condition, but it does not slide over. If the condition is true, it processes the loop. Oh, then when it hits the bottom, it comes back up on the other side, bumps it up, and processes the condition again. And from then on, it's doing this over and over and over again until the condition is false. Then it drops up. Automatic.
So it's important. That's a good question. This does not process the first time we hit this. Right? And if we go back to that flow chart in my notes, if I can, if we go back to that flow chart in my notes, it should make it fairly obvious that I don't hit the increment the first time through. I do the counter, and then I do one of these two things. I either go this way or I go that way, but I don't do the increment. So I come down here, I check the condition, it's true, I process, and then I increment. So it's like an afterthought. Almost. I don't want to call it an afterthought, but that's why I use this, this symbol, right? Is that we don't process this because the arrow's going that way. We go this way, then we process. We increment. First time through the loop, you don't increment. From then on, you increment, check the condition, increment, check the condition until it's false, and then you get out. Good question. But again, we can see that because my loop starts at five. What if I wanted a whole bunch of nickels? There. Notice how many lines of code it took. Three. Now watch what happens. Watch that there should be, I'm guessing there's going to be a slight delay here. You see it? My scroll bar got big and it shrunk, 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 because it was calculating how big the text box is, but it worked, but I had to wait. That was painful. <laughs> All that waiting was really painful. When we come back from break, I'm going to show you how to fix that so that there's no delay. I'm also going to explain why. So let's take 10, we'll come back, and we'll fix that.